Hi, this is Andy Elby from the University of Maryland, and this is my second lecture on mathematical sense making. Before watching this lecture, please watch part one, which was posted in unit six. This lecture is going to pick up right where that one left off. So this one will make even less sense than it normally would if you haven't watched part one. A few reminders about these math sense making lectures. Part of what mathematical sense making is, as I emphasized in the part one lecture, is figuring out what an equation says conceptually in terms of common sense ideas. So mathematical sense making isn't a physics topic like energy or circular motion. It's an approach to problem solving and learning. And in my part one lecture, I focused on multiple choice problem solving. And this lecture is going to focus on free response problem solving. As last time, I'm not gonna just yak at you for 30 minutes. Periodically, I'm gonna ask you to pause the lecture and solve a problem I've just put up. So let's get right into it. I'm gonna talk about how to use mathematical sense making to address new equations you're seeing on the fly while solving free response questions. A typical free response question that requires mathematical sense making, and it's most commonly problem number three on the old AP Physics One exams, is the problem will first ask you some conceptual questions about a physical scenario, maybe parts A and B of the free response item. Then maybe in part C, you'll be given or you'll derive a new equation that you maybe haven't seen before. And then you'll answer questions involving that equation, questions that can best be solved using mathematical sense making, drawing on the conceptual reasoning the problem led you through in earlier parts. Let's jump right into an example, connected blocks problem. In this figure, the two blocks are connected by a very light rope slung over a pulley. All the usual idealizing assumptions apply, frictionless table, frictionless spinny pulley. Um, and the blocks are gonna be released from rest and block B is gonna fall dragging along block A. And here come the conceptual questions that usually precede, precede the mathematical sense making questions. Suppose, suppose block A is much more massive than block B. How bit, what will block B's acceleration be approximately after it's released? And then conversely, now suppose it's block B that's much more massive than block A. In that case, what's the approximate magnitude of the acceleration of block B after the two blocks are released? So please pause this lecture and write out answers to those two problems and then restart me when you're done. All right, let's get into one possible solution. Here's the first question. If block A is much more massive than B, about what is their, their acceleration? Well, one way to think about conceptual questions like this is to think of an analogous situation. Here, block B is the dragger dragging along block A. So if block A is super massive, it's like a truck and the dragger, you can imagine it's a small child, is like block B trying to drag along a really, really heavy thing. With a small child dragging a truck, you expect hardly any motion. Similarly, when light block B is dragging along very, very massive block A, block B is going to fall barely at all the acceleration is going to be approximately zero. Now let's consider the other case where it's block B that's much, much more massive than block A. So we can imagine that block B is a very powerful dragger, like a, like a truck, and the thing it's dragging is very light, like a, a soccer ball attached to a rope. If a truck is dragging along a soccer ball by a rope, the, the truck doesn't even really notice the soccer ball is there. The truck's motion is going to be pretty much the same as if we cut the soccer ball loose. Um, similarly, 
thinking more directly about the scenario, if block B is an anvil and block A is a French fry, that anvil is going to fall pretty much as if the French fry weren't even there. So the point is, if block B is much more massive than A, block A is hardly going to affect the motion of B. Block B is going to fall as if block A weren't even there practically. And therefore, it's going to be falling just under the influence of gravity freely, acceleration approximately equal to G. All right, so these are the conceptual reasoning questions that are then going to set up the math sense making question. Here it is. Without making assumptions about the relative masses of the two blocks, MA and MB, a distracted professor solves for the acceleration of block B and gets this equation. Boom. The professor made a mistake. This equation is wrong. Without deriving the correct equation, in other words, without actually figuring out the right answer for the acceleration, explain how you know this equation must be incorrect. In other words, why it isn't plausible. How do you know this equation must be wrong? So again, please pause this lecture and solve this problem. All right, let's get into it. On this kind of mathematical sense-making question, some strategies include checking for the units. And because that's a strategy your textbook probably emphasized, I'm gonna skip it for now and just tell you the distracted professor's equation is, the units are fine. There's not a units mistake in there. It's wrong for another reason. So the main strategy is to check the proportionalities and inverse proportionalities and see if they make physical sense. And we're looking for a case where they don't make physical sense to tell us the equation must be wrong. Let's start with the direct proportionality in the equation between the acceleration and little g. The equation says that block b's acceleration is proportional to g, which means if g is increased, then a goes up as well. Now, you normally think of little g as a constant, not something you can increase or decrease, but we can increase the gravitational field strength g by, say, repositioning this whole setup on Jupiter. In that case, g would be bigger. And you might expect that on Jupiter, block b is going to be pulled down harder due to stronger gravity. b would be pulled down harder and would therefore accelerate more quickly. So it does make physical sense that if G is increased, if gravity somehow gets stronger, the acceleration of the system is going to be greater. So that's not something nonsensical about this equation. That makes sense. Let's now check the inverse proportionality between the acceleration and the mass of block A. The equation says it's inversely proportional. So in other words, if you increase the mass of block A, the equation says if you increase this denominator, the acceleration is going to go down. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, that's what we reasoned above in the conceptual reasoning. If block A is made more massive, then block B is pulling a larger load, and therefore block B accelerates less quickly. So, so far, the proportionalities and inverse proportionalities in the equation all make sense. There's one more to check though. The equation says that A is directly proportional to the mass of block B. Therefore, the equation says if the mass of block B goes up, so does the acceleration of the system. And at first glance, that does make sense, but the equation says it's a proportionality. That means if we double MB, we double the acceleration. If we double the mass of block B again, we double the acceleration again. According to this equation, we could just keep doubling the mass of block B a million times, thereby making A a million times bigger than it started. But that doesn't make sense. Because above, we found that even if block B is the heaviest thing you can imagine and A is the lightest thing you can imagine, 
the fastest block B can accelerate is just little g, the acceleration due to gravity. By making an object heavier, you don't make it accelerate downward faster than little g. So in brief, this equation says you can make the acceleration as big as you want by just making the mass of block B as big as you want. But the conceptual reasoning told us that no, that's not true. The acceleration can never be bigger than little g. So that's why this equation isn't plausible. That's what's wrong with the equation. That's how even before deriving the correct equation, we can conclude this equation is incorrect. So takeaways from this problem are that mathematical sense-making enabled us to reason on the fly about an equation we hadn't seen before, whether it's a correct or an incorrect equation. And another key takeaway is when we were reasoning through the equation, the mathematical reasoning wasn't in place of common sense conceptual reasoning. The mathematical reasoning was combined with integrated with common sense intuitive reasoning. And that is what mathematical sense making is. That's the heart of it. And that's what we're now going to practice some more. Here's another problem. It's a puck rod collision problem. In this figure, this gray circle is a hockey puck, say. And this blue rectangle is a rod. And importantly, this is a top-down view. The puck and the rod are both sitting on the floor. Uh, a nail is driven through the center of the rod, attaching it to the floor, but the rod can rotate around that nail frictionlessly. And of course, the puck also can slide frictionlessly, the usual simplifying assumptions. Let's say it slides to the right at speed v naught, and it's going to hit the rod and bounce off elastically. And by the way, the puck is much lighter than the rod. And after the collision, so here's the puck, here's the rod, it's gonna go boom, and the rod's gonna be knocked to rotate counterclockwise. And now part A of this multi-part problem, a conceptual question that's gonna set up later mathematical sense-making. Two trials, in trial A, the puck's going to be set into motion here and is therefore going to hit the rod at point A. The system's then reset. And now the puck is going to be set into motion further away from the pivot and is then going to hit the rod at point B. The question is, in which of those two trials, if either, does the rod end up with more angular speed? In which case does it end up spinning faster, in other words? Briefly explain your reasoning. It's a very typical conceptual question. And please pause this lecture and see if you can solve it. So one strategy to begin approaching a problem like this is to consider an analogous situation that's easier to, to reason about and use your common sense on that analogous situation. So imagine pushing open a heavy door. You can push on the door closer to the hinge, closer to its pivot, or further from its hinge, further from the pivot. Just intuitively, what do you want to do? Which push is going to make the door open more easily? And you know from everyday experience, you want to push open the door further from the hinge. So why is that? Well, if we're talking about pushes that make things rotate, we're talking about torques. And you might know from what you've learned in class so far, if you've reached this point, that torque depends not only on how hard you push, but on where you push, specifically how far away from the pivot you push. And this equation for torque formalizes that insight. So in trial B, the puck is pushing on the rod, so to speak, further from the pivot and therefore other things being equal exerts a bigger torque. And that bigger torque makes the rod spin faster in trial B. And here's the quick summary of that. All right, let's move on to part B and now comes the first math sense-making question.
M rod and M disc are the masses of the rod and disc respectively. Curly L is the length of the rod. And importantly, X as shown in this diagram is the distance between the pivot point and the point where the puck collides with the rod. On the internet, a student finds an equation for the rod's angular speed after the collision in this scenario. And here's the equation that the student found. Does this equation agree with the reasoning from part A? Briefly explain why or why not. And just to remind you, in part A, we concluded that the rod spins faster in trial B than in trial A because of a difference in the torques. So please pause the lecture and solve this problem. So to answer a question like this, a good first step is to translate your reasoning and conclusion from the earlier conceptual problem into a relationship between variables that appear in the equation. That's really abstract. Let me show you what I mean by that. Our conclusion from part A was that the rod ends up with greater angular speed in trial B because during the collision, the puck exerts a bigger torque on the rod when it collides with the rod farther from the pivot. So where, where's a relationship between variables hiding in that wordy explanation? Well, it's here. The rod ends up with greater angular speed omega when it collides with the rod farther from the pivot point. The farness, the distance from the pivot point is what we defined X as. So our conclusion from part A translated to be more concise is when X is greater, the angular speed ends up greater. Or to express it even more concisely, according to the part A conceptual reasoning, when X is made bigger, that makes the angular speed of the rod after the collision get bigger as well. All right. So we've taken the conceptual reasoning from part A and translated it into a relationship between two variables that appear in the equation. Now, step two, does our conclusion from part A made expressed more concisely agree with what the equation says? Again, our conclusion from part A was that if X is made bigger, then the angular speed of the rod after the collision goes up. Does that agree with the given equation? Well, in the equation, we see that omega is proportional to x. x appears in the numerator. So the equation says omega is proportional to x. And therefore, if x goes up, omega goes up. For instance, according to this equation, if x is doubled, then omega gets doubled. So now just look at the bright yellow text on the screen. Our conclusion from part A is that if X goes up, then omega goes up. The equation says that if X goes up, the omega goes up. So the equation found on the internet agrees with our part A reasoning and answer. Now, how in the throes of an AP Physics 1 exam, could you write up that slide full or two slides full of logic to answer a briefly explained type question? Again, reminder, the question was, does this equation agree with the reasoning from part A? Briefly explain why or why not. Here's how you can write up all that reasoning very briefly. Equation says omega proportional to x, implying if x goes up, then omega goes up agrees with part A. Bigger X in trial B led to bigger torque, led to bigger omega. So that's really briefly summarizing all the relevant reasoning, but in a way that shows the greater, you understand what you're talking about. Let's go on to part C of this problem, another mathematical sense-making question. The equation found on the internet from part B, here it is again, is not correct. 
even though it agreed with the reasoning in part A, it does not give the rods angular speed after the collision. There's something else wrong with it. Explain how you can tell the equation is incorrect without deriving the correct, correct equation for this scenario. So please pause this lecture and address that problem. All right. So the overall strategy is to explore the proportionalities, inverse proportionalities, and other functional relationships between variables in the equation to see if they make sense. And we're looking for one that doesn't make sense. Now, one thing to check is, is there a variable that seems intuitively relevant, that seems like it should be in the equation because it should affect the final angular speed, but isn't there in the equation? That would be something that's wrong with the equation and therefore the answer to part C. Well, we can think that through sort of intuitively, looking at the diagram. Intuitively, how fast the rod ends up spinning, it should depend on like how heavy this, this puck is, how fast the puck's moving, could well depend, definitely depend on the mass of the, of the rod and maybe the length of the rod matters too. And we already figured out it definitely depends on X, this distance. So these are things that intuitively might or should matter, but they're all in the equation. They're already accounted for. So there's nothing obvious missing from this equation. Um, we're, we can't get a quick answer to this problem by finding the missing variable. So we have to continue with this overall strategy, now focusing on the proportional and inverse proportional relationships to see which ones make sense and which ones don't. So let's just arbitrarily start with the relationship between omega and V naught. The equation says V naught's in the numerator, therefore omega is directly proportional to V naught. And therefore say if we doubled V naught, omega would also double. Does it make sense that if V naught is increased, then omega increases as well? Well, yes, it does. A bigger initial velocity of the puck would lead to a stronger collision between the puck and the rod, and therefore the rod would end up spinning more quickly afterwards. So that proportionality makes sense. Okay, I'm back. So another thing to check is therefore the proportional and inverse proportional relationships. Do they make sense? We have to look at another one besides V naught. According to the equation, omega is directly proportional to M rod. In other words, if M rod is increased, then omega is increased. Does that make sense? Well, if we make the rod much, much heavier, well, I'm going to pause and let you think this out. All right, I'm back. No, it doesn't make sense. If the rod is made more massive, it's got more inertia or specifically rotational inertia, even without that fancy physics concepts, just intuitively, a much heavier rod is gonna care less about that little puck colliding with it. It's gonna react less to the collision and therefore the rod is gonna gain less angular speed. So this proportionality between omega and the mass of the rod does not make sense. That's what's wrong, or at least one of the things that's wrong with this equation. And therefore that's the answer to part C. Now, again, there's the issue of how do you summarize that complex logic to answer a briefly explained question? Here's the question. Explain how you can tell the equation is incorrect. I should have said briefly explain. These questions will almost always be briefly explained, except on the paragraph long questions that appear on the free response sections. Here's one possible brief answer. Equation says omega proportional to m rod, implying if m rod goes up, then omega goes up. But actually, adding mass to rod would make it react less 
gaining less angular speed during collision. Again, that's leaving out plenty of nuances, but it's enough for a briefly explain to show the greater you know what you're talking about. Now, that was one way to answer part C, but there are others. The proportionality with M rod might not be the only thing wrong with the equation. So what I'd like you to do now is investigate another functional relationship, specifically the inverse proportionality between omega and the mass of the disk. Does that inverse proportionality make sense? Please pause this lecture and think that out. OK. The question at hand is, if we increase the mask of the disk, the equation says the angular speed of the rod after the collision decreases. Does that make sense? No. Intuitively, if we make the puck more massive, then it's going to collide with the rod more strongly. More technically, it's going to bring more angular momentum into the collision. But you wouldn't need to know the, the technical terms and ways of thinking there. Just intuitively, a bigger, a heavier, more massive puck, when it rams into the rod, is going to make the rod react more. It's going to make it spin more afterwards. So. This inverse proportionality makes no sense. The inverse proportionality says a heavier disk leads to less angular speed, whereas intuitively, we expect more angular speed after the collision. So takeaways from the rod puck collision problem are that proportional and inverse proportional reasoning are particularly valuable when you're figuring out what an equation says and whether what it says makes sense. And again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Mathematical thinking and common sense intuitive thinking cannot be separated on these types of problems. You've got to use them together, as I've been demonstrating during this lecture, um, to, to successfully answer these mathematical sense making questions. So coming soon, there's going to be another mathematical sense making lecture where I'll pose more free response problems of slightly different types. And thank you very much for watching this lecture.